All right, well, good, good morning, guys. Uh, thanks for coming here today to uh, Spring Thematic University. My name is Danny Moran. This is the third class, and we're going to talk about dry pipe and pre-action systems. So the whole premise of um, fire protection is that we, we, want, we want the system to be automatic, and we want the system to be wet. That's the most preferred thing that we could do. Unless we're concerned with accidental water, which is uh, we'll get into where you're going to have pre-action, but when you can't do um, a wet system, then you have to do dry. So NMPA tells you that if you can't keep the temperature maintained uh, in the area or outside um, above 40 degrees, then the dry dry pipe system must be installed. So we live in Florida down here, South Florida. You're not really going to see a whole lot, but there are dry pipe systems down here. Where would you think you'd find them? Several homes, freezer. hospitals, cold storage, freezer, and cold storage. Where you're going to find true dry pipe. Um, what yeah. you're talking about, pre, yeah. that's more where you're going to see like pre-action stuff, right? Where people and, um, are afraid of accidental water. On roof, um, you got the loose systems. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, these systems do exist down here, and uh, they um, in Florida there actually is uh, what NFPA I guess would determine to be a freeze line. Uh, I want to say somewhere around the Orlando area where uh, you're going to start seeing more dry pipe systems because the temperature drops below 40 quite often up there. So um, you're going to see more dry pipe systems up there. But down here, yeah, you're definitely going to see them in freezer storage, cold storage docks, and uh, the pre-action uh, systems where you were just describing as well. Um, so the, these dry pipe systems, they're they're kept dry because of the dry pipe valve. So the dry pipe valve utilizes uh, a differential to hold that clapper shut. Uh, a lot of people will think that the air pressure on the top side is, is stronger than the water pressure underneath and that's what holds the clapper closed and it's just, that's wrong. Air pressure is pressure no matter what it is. It's the surface differential which helps keep that valve closed. So uh, we'll show you the valve outside and there's some good pictures here of of the valve, uh, cutouts of the valve and stuff, and you'll see. But basically the top surface area of that clapper is 5.75 times bigger than the surface area underneath, and that's what's able to keep the clapper closed. It's not that the air is heavier than the water, okay? Does that make sense? So um, this is just a one model of the dry pipe valve. This is the Model F from Viking, and if you're not, you know, and like I said, the reason why I got into learning and want to learn more about this stuff is because if you find a such situation where you're where you're confused, you don't know what to do, and and you look like an idiot trying to figure out your job, um, you start trying to learn more. And another thing that really is intimidating is that all these little pieces here, that's all trim, right? So if you go out there and you look at some of these valves and you see all these pipes that are going in and out of places. I mean, if you just start looking at that, or you walk into a fire pump room for the first time, I see the look on firefighters' faces when I say, hey, let's go do some zone familiarization. We go out to a building and I take it into a fire pump room and a room this big and the fire pump in the middle and pipes and valves going everywhere. And I know exactly where I go to look at stuff when I want to get some information. Like, hey, I want to see what pressure the fire pump runs at. I want to see this. I want to see the test header control valve. And I look at the faces of guys there in here, and they, they're, <laughs> they're just, still, they're, still falling they're looking apart. around, and they're looking at the floor, and they see water dripping down the drain, they're like, hey, is that water supposed to be dripping there? And, you know, so it's, it could be very intimidating if you don't know um, what you're looking at. So all these, all these pipes on the outside of this valve here, this is, it's called trim, and every alarm valve is going to have them. Uh, and when I say alarm valve, I mean like a check valve, like either uh, a wet or a dry but something where you have an alarm valve there. Um, so the trim has two main functions. It's either to test the alarm or to create the alarm. Um, you'll see right here, there's these two valves here, the alarm shutoff valve and the alarm test valve. So the alarm test valve is always closed and the alarm shutoff valve is always open. And the reason why is that we don't wanna generate accidental, accidental uh, trips of the system because we don't want to ha generate false alarms, right? That's like the sprinkler guy's uh, worst sin is to create false alarms. So when you're testing the uh, alarm alarm valve right there, you're going to open that alarm test valve, and that's going to allow water to flow through the pipes and, and test the alarm. And uh, if you have the alarm shutoff valve closed, even when you go to test it, you're not going to get that alarm. And if the 
if the system actually does trip, the alarm will be going off because you've got the alarm shut off valve closed. So a lot of times you'll see guys, uh, like a best practice is to zip tie that alarm shut off valve open so that it's always in the open position. And uh, if they need to close it for maintenance on the system, they just gotta remember to, to tie it open again. All right, so that's what it looks like with all the trim put together and placed on the valve. And like I said, that's pretty simple trim right there. When we go outside and look at some of the, uh, like the pre-action, the double interlocks, especially you get all the, uh, the trim becomes a lot more intricate and uh, could be a lot more intimidating when you look at it for the first time. So all of these drive pipe systems, um, obviously they have to have an air, uh, they have to have air compressor to generate that air pressure with the system. And along with that air compressor, there has to be an air maintenance device and the supervisory air switch, all right? Just like in a wet system, how we have the flow switch that detects if there's water flowing, uh, the supervisory air pressure switch detects when, when air pressure is lost in the system as well. All right, this is what that air maintenance device looks like. Um, like I said, basically just to uh, make sure that the pressure stays in the system. They have to be adjusted in the field. There's a picture comes up here. There you go. There's a little cutout of what it looks like on the inside. All right, so they basically they set that set that device in the field on the pipe when they're installing it. Um, there's the adjustment screw up there, and basically what happens is uh, you'll see the next slides. Air is going to come in here and, and lift that that ball check up, and that's how. Uh, the air pressure is set. Comes up this way. Here's the outlet. That spring pushes down on the diaphragm, and that's how the pressure is kept in check in that um, in the air in the air system. Okay. Um, and it be also, and it's, I'm gonna apologize also because uh, for one, I'm drinking coffee while I'm talking to you guys. So, anyways, uh. NPA 13 will tell you that the dry systems, uh, they're required to deliver water to the most remote sprinkler in within one minute. And if they can't deliver that within one minute, then they have to have a, uh, what's called an accelerator added to the trim. So right up here, this is the accelerator device on, the, on this trim, that right there. Okay, the sprinkler heads that you'll see on dry pipe systems, you'll see a lot of these dry barrel sprinklers uh, uprights as well and horizontal sidewalls. Uh, you're not going to see a whole lot of pendants, but when you do see the pendants, uh, the sprinkler and the line supplying it have to be in a, in the heat in a heated area, right? Because we don't want to end up with water freezing in there and causing the, an obstruction that won't allow the, the device to activate. Right, so there's the. Uh, the valve, uh, just basic some specs. To, like I said, the 5.75 to 1 differential, that's what keeps that clapper closed. Uh, UL listed, factory mutual approved, and uh, 175 psi of water working pressure. So, this is a cutout of it, what it looks like on the inside. And basically, what you're looking at here is a, a tripped valve, right? Because the clapper is in the open position here. Um, when the valve does trip and that clapper opens up, it's held in place with, the, with that latch so that it doesn't accidentally close back again. Um, and right here, this is the <coughs> face plate that uh, has four bolts on it. When you take that off, you'll be able to uh, get in there and reset it. Uh, it's the same picture from before. Now that's that's always the best way to reset it because some of them you just hit the they have a little button and you, you hit it and it goes right back. Oh really? Yeah. But then you got to trust that button is. That's the problem. Yeah. 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 Not that's only, the best not way. only that, but think about it. If that doesn't latch and that falls down, just the head pressure it has no pressure at all. Just the volume, yeah. the weight of the water, uh -huh. and the column is enough to keep that from flowing water. Yeah because of the fact that of your 5 to 1, 5.75? Yeah, 5.75. 5 5.75 pressure difference. So if you have if you have a 60 foot high column, how much water pressure is that? It's Round numbers, it's, it's 5 psi per 10 feet or so. Yeah, it's 
six something. So it's like 28 pounds, but 28 pounds was enough to hold 60 pounds of water pressure or 80 pounds of water pressure. So that's why that latch has to work. So the best way, it's yeah, you've got the button there. is always to open it up and make sure it's yeah. reset. Yeah. And also check it, check the operation, yeah. make sure it will <coughs> latch easy. If it won't latch, you know, until you open it up, you're, you're, you're kidding yourself. Because yeah. if it doesn't latch easy, then it won't operate properly if it doesn't have any flow. Because static water has no pressure behind it, right? So that clapper will fall back down, and then you won't get any water. Another good thing too is that when you open up the faceplate there, <coughs> you're um, you're able to see the the seats of each side of the valve. You're supposed to wipe yeah. them clean so that there's no debris there, keeping you know uh, keeping it from latching and sealing properly. Yeah. So, um, but basically the, uh, this will break it down how to put put it back in service. So like I said, this is a cutout of the valve that's tripped. Uh, obviously, we're going to shut down the water supply uh, control valve first. We're going to open up the main drain and drain all the water out. Uh, it's the only way that we can reset it. There's the faceplate. We're going to remove those bolts. All right. Uh, you have to lift up that latch on the inside to get that clapper to come back down. Before we do that, we're going to run your finger, <coughs> excuse me, over the air seat and the water seat to remove that debris. Uh, check if there's any there. Right, and then we can bring the clapper on down. And then a lot of them have, uh, and that's what I was gonna ask you, if you have the button there, let's say the, the button doesn't work, do they have the tools there uh, no, to do it manually? You have to carry that yourself. Oh, okay. But usually the panel won't clear <coughs> if the system is not. It won't clear, it'll tell you, it won't, it won't go back to normal. Right. So once you put everything back, then you, you'll see the panel will clear out. So you'll know it's something wrong because the right, panel's right. always going to... Yeah, be. yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, because then uh, you're going to need that tool there to put the tool in there, push it down, make sure that the clapper latches properly. you got to lift it in that upper position. Put the faceplate back on, and you're ready to go. Then you just got to go to the panel. So that's what it looks like when it's fully uh, latched and closed and ready to place in service. Don't you also have to put a little water in the system so you have a little... Uh, some of them do. Um, I remember one of the guys from Viking that was here was talking about that. Uh, depending on the valve, I don't think any of the Viking valves require you to put water on them, but um, in the past there has been valves where they the instructions to reset will then tell you to put a, a, like a gallon of water on top there. Uh, just to make sure that there's no, uh, like for leaks, I think, right? If there was leaks keeps, coming through the seat. It keeps the seal wet, basically. Yeah. And that was that was basically it, just to, to make sure that the seal stays think, wet. Um, um, Grinnell's system is that way. Grinnell was like that? I think. I, I just know that there's, after you set it and you put the cover in, or before you put the cover in, you can put a little water in, mm -hmm. and then you put the, because it, it sits, little well, more of a well uh -huh. and then you put the water in it and there's a there's a fill line and you turn that off and you put the, the uh, inspection cover off and then you make sure that valve stays because otherwise it'll fill up. Gotcha, system. yeah. Oh, do you want to picture that? Uh, no, I mean, I just, sorry. You got it? Yeah, thank you. It, was there anything else that uh, you wanted a picture of? Because I saw you. Oh no, I don't no, know no. I, I, just, I just like taking pictures of everything. Okay, yeah. If I if I zoom too fast, just let me know, uh, and I'll I'll keep it up there so you can get a shot. All right. So then we got to uh, pressurize the system with the air, obviously. So uh, this, the clapper has to be set. Um, the air is either going to be uh, compressed air or nitrogen. I think more systems are trying to go to the nitrogen because. Um, there, there is um, evidence of, it's called, I think it's called MIC, right? The, yeah. Even in dry systems, there's still evidence yeah. of, of MIC because it's just, if it's compressed air, you're going to have a little bit of moisture in there. You're going to generate the, um, what's it stand for? Micro, uh, microbial uh, induced, corrosion. induced corrosion. That's right, yeah. Okay, so um, a lot of the systems are, are starting to move more towards the nitrogen because there's a lot less chance of that developing with the nitrogen systems. All 
and uh, uh, Viking with their uh, valves, they strongly suggest to use the tank mounted air compressor uh, so that you're not short cycling the air there. <clears throat> All right, so once the, uh, th there's, uh, once the air pressure is set, um, you know, you could, you're, you're good to go. The, uh, I think there's a little formula that they use here. Yeah, they had it yeah. on the page before too. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Static and divided by five. Yeah. yeah. Static water pressure divided by five, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're going to look at for your air pressure. And keep that clapper closed. These are all really good pictures of uh, the cutout. Everything going into place. Computers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there's your primary. Yeah, it puts water into the bottom. Yeah. That's what you were talking about, right? Like yeah, a little fill, yeah, fill. Yeah, it just it keeps the seal wet. Okay. So maybe Viking does require you to put a little bit of water there. Then. Yeah, it's you got to yeah you got an overflow for the, for the alarm, the rubber hose. That's this, right? The, well, yeah, the it's drip. the drain that runs into the floor. <clears throat> well, I heard that drain right, the drain the on the drip bowl right there. Mm -hmm. If you push it and water constantly comes out, that means you have a problem with with the seals inside. And if air constantly comes out, that means you have issues with the air line. Yeah. That's what the guy, I, I came to the last The little guy. button, see okay. the, just above yeah. the funnel, the, the button there, that's a, like a... This right here? Yeah, it's like a, yeah. a, a, like a, a line relief? drain. No, it's like a line drain, you push it, and water will come out. Okay. If the, if it's stuck and where the debris in it and water keeps coming out all the time, then either you have you're going to have a dry sump, in the, mm -hmm. or there's a leak in it and water still coming out. <coughs> like you said, if there's air, that means there's no water in it. So either way, it needs to be serviced. Yeah, it needs to be serviced. But yeah. you can add more water to it, and then. Um, with your priming level and it has a level that's supposed to stay at you know there's a there's another flow off and that's probably what that is so that it has a fill line just like you take a cap on a little lawnmower and you take the other one off and pour oil until it starts sure on the other one and that yeah all right and then we got the air gauge there See when you right. when you when you do your prime your intermediate chamber that's the part you're filling water that's where the right here right in there that's the part you're filling that's what you're filling with the primer with this right here right, right? yeah all right then open the control valve and back in business slow yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. You gotta order some wine, open it three turns and stop. Well, they usually say you open up your main drain a little bit, while, and then you open up your control valve to, so it Help doesn't get it up, yeah. yeah, so you get, you get a, a wet column uh, instead of <coughs> air. A hammer, water hammer? Yeah. No, no, not a water hammer. Uh, well, you get an air block because if water's coming up, water's heavier than air, so the air is gonna stay above it, and then I'll get, won't give you water at the valve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you open your, keep your main drain open Think a little bit. Huh? Like a portion of the season? Well, basically, yeah. You get yeah, the air yeah, and the rest of the top because you already worked on it. And, you know, so you want to have that column up to the up to the to the valve wet. So that's why you leave your main drain open, and then you only open your supply or your intake line just a little bit. Yeah, like they like said, basically, like to purge it a little bit, right? Yeah. And right, there's that drip check valve we talked about. And obviously once you open the control valve, then you're going to have pressure on your water side also. Yeah. And this is basically what happens in fire condition. 
Uh, sprinkler reaches its temperature, breaks. Sprinkler, the closed sprinkler is now open. Air pressure loses. Latches once uh, it's when it's fully open it goes into the latch position. Um, NFPA 13 requires a dry pipe system. The design of the system requires that 30 percent more sprinklers are in a dry pipe system than on the wet because of that delay, right? So while we're waiting for that, you know, it doesn't seem like a long time that one minute, but while we're waiting for that air to exhaust before the water gets there, the fire could be potentially growing. So they require 30 percent more sprinkler heads in that design area. Uh, to control a potentially bigger fire once water arrives. All right, so that's basically um, dry systems, right? So, like I said, uh, we prefer to have that automatic system be wet so that if there is a fire, uh, water is there right away. Uh, the problem with that is that if we have an accidental sprinkler break, like a ladder, or what a lot of people like to do is for some reason hang their clothes, from sprinkler heads in hotels and in their apartment buildings, uh, what happens? We get water. Uh, same thing with the dry pipe. Well, now if we can't maintain that temperature at 40 degrees and we go to the dry pipe, but the problem is that what's going to happen with the dry pipe system if a construction worker carrying a ladder knocks a sprinkler head off, or somebody in a dry pipe system uses that sprinkler head to hang their clothes and they break the glass. When they break the glass, they look up and go, oh man, I broke the sprinkler. Oh, thank God there's no water coming out. Now what's going to happen within 60 mm -hmm. seconds? Yeah. Water is coming, right? So that's the downfalls of the dry pipe is that uh, you're still going to have water if you, um, if you don't want it to come. It's still going to be there. So that's why people put pre-action systems in. It's an elected system to install because they're afraid of accidental water damage. Um, there's basically uh, the two main types are single interlock and double interlock. And what that means is basically the the actions that need to happen before the valve is tripped. So pre-action just alone, when you hear pre-action, it means that basically before the action happens, right, before that valve is tripped and the system is flowing, something has to happen to allow that to, to occur. So with the single interlock, it's only one action that needs to happen. With the double interlock, it's two actions, all right, if that makes sense. Um, so, <coughs> Uh, we just talked about this, freeze, uh, that's pre-action, uh, and we talked about where we're going to see these. So freezers, coolers, computer rooms, especially like we talked about uh, the dry pipe you're going to see in that freezers and coolers just because of the temperature, but where you're going to see pre-action stuff is in more of this type of area down here, right? Like uh, rare books, a, li a library with historical records, uh, gymnasium floors, antique car rooms, you know, stuff where you don't want nasty, smelly, wet water <laughs> ruining all your stuff, right? Um, so <clears throat> this is uh, basically a, a, like cutouts of the deluge valves that are associated with the pre-action systems. Uh, there's the Model F and the Model E from Viking. All right, both these uh, valves listed and approved for 250 PSI. These are all parts to it, right? So. Uh, same thing with like the uh, dry pipe valve. You have the face plate with the bolts that hold everything in place. Uh, every valve has the valve seat and the clapper, right? And the different chambers, almost similar to uh, the dry pipe valve. You have your uh, priming chamber. This is your inlet right here. Water coming in and water going out. All right, so this is what it looks like here, setting it up. Okay, so that's the valve operating. And again, just like the, uh, the dry pipe, the, the sprinkler heads that you're gonna see on here, more dry barrel upright and the horizontal sidewalls. And the same thing with the uh, dry pipe valve if you're going to have the pendant sprinklers it has to be on a return bend where um, the liner in, in a heated area. Alright so 
we talked about the uh, releasing mechanisms a little bit. For single interlock, it's one mechanism. For double interlock, it's two. Um, uh, the system that's out here, basically the, the air pressure in the single interlock reaction system, the air pressure is supervisory air pressure only. Um, so when we, on a pre-action system, if we, a single interlock pre-action system, if we break that sprinkler head, we lose air pressure, we're going to get a supervisory alarm at the alarm panel, but water is not flowing, right? The only way water would flow is let's say there's a heat detector or a smoke detector or infrared, some yeah. type of detecting system. Well, well, the sprinkler head will fuse, pop, air pressure will go on, it'll preset the system, but it won't go off until both. You have two different interlock, interlock systems. The idea is that the water doesn't flow until you know you have fire. Well, the only way a mechanical thing is you got, okay, the sprinkler head went off, fused, all right, it's venting air, but that could be, like you said, from somebody with a ladder or in rack storage and they knock off the sprinkler head. Well, if there's no heat or no smoke or any visible flame, it won't set off, it won't do off the other part of the system. Yeah, the detector, the detector opens that cylinder. It's like a light switch, right? Yeah, I've done it before. Yeah. And, um, and that's the only thing that will trip the system. Yeah, you got cross zones. Yeah, for a single interlock, you usually end up having a, a cross zone or a double zone detector. So, um, let's say it uh, detects a, and a, a reason, uh, another reason with this the thing with the single interlock is that it's if you're going to install a pre-action system, the m most typical one that you're going to see is the single interlock because it acts more like a wet system in a fire, right? So if there is a fire, the detector is going to detect the smoke. And let's say we have two zones in here, smoke detector goes off here, and we have at the alarm panel smoke zone one, and as the smoke travels across, now we're gonna have smoke zone two. As soon as that double zone detector, that's the, what closes the electrical circuit, opens that solenoid valve, and the valve is tripped, water starts flowing, but it doesn't discharge until the sprinkler head is, reaches its temperature, right? So that's why a lot of times you know, you'll see that installed because you break a sprinkler head or somebody puts a, a hanger, you know, whatever it is, an accidental break in a sprinkler head is going to discharge air pressure, but it's only supervisory air. You're going to get a supervisory alarm at the panel, low air alarm, and all you got to do is replace the head, uh, restore air pressure, and reset the system, and you're good <coughs> to go, right? So you don't have water flowing. So the, the detector is basically, it acts as that light switch to turn on the Oh, to trip the system and allow water to flow through the valve. All right, so here's that uh, solenoid valve on the uh, single interlock, basically showing you how the water comes in. And, you know, it's a solenoid valve, just like any valve, it just controls the direction of water. So it has to have an inlet and an outlet. And uh, one, one of the things I learned from one of the guys from Viking that was here uh, when uh, talking about the panels is that a lot of people that have problems resetting the panels um, and they call and ask for troubleshooting. He says a lot of the times when they say we can't get your panel to to uh, clear out, we can't get a green panel here. And he asks them, well, are your solenoid valves installed correctly? Because if they're installed backwards, in and out versus out and in, then the the system isn't going to work right. So a lot of times uh, installing them, and they call Viking and say, hey, we are we're having a hard time setting up your system here. They'll say, check your solenoid valves. Is, you know, you don't look, you don't think that it matters, but it, it does. does Every yeah. valve has an in and out, and it has to be put on the uh, on the trim the per correct way. You know, when, when I take my guys out in my zone to do like some training and stuff, we go check out some buildings, walk the building, look at the fire pump, check out some valves. Um, and I was trying to show some guys pressure reducing valves. So I went into the, a building and I said, "Oh, I'm sure there's going to be one on the first floor." Of this building it's a 30-story building fire pump runs pretty good pressure so I just went to the first floor yep here's one right here and I said let me take a picture of this so we can do some training you know and I was putting together a little PowerPoint for the guys at the department I didn't notice it at the time but when I was making the class I zoomed in on the tag that's hanging off that pressure reducing valve that was in the lobby of this building and the tag said seventh floor so when you talk about 
do we inspect things, make sure that things are installed correctly in the right places? I mean, that's, that's, it's not really the fire department's job. Like, do your inspectors, do you know, do they go check buildings like that before they are occupied? Yeah, because I, I honestly don't know how that works. I don't know if we just rely on the contractor. And everything like that, yeah. yeah. So they go out and do all that. Our, that was a big fine, though. Yeah, it was. Because well, how long have it been there? Well, what I want to know, because ha having the seventh floor valve on the yeah. first floor, What's that's the not floor? really a big problem because we can overcome that. But I want to know where the one that's supposed to be on the first floor is. If the one that's on the first floor is on the seventh floor, now we have an issue. Well, because then we have a, a lot. Then we have more pressure restriction going but don't, on. Can't you just adjust them to the right pressure? They're preset. No, this was they're, a fact. This was oh, a factory set. Yeah, I know there's some that you can just. Adjust. Some are some are field adjustable. Yeah, but this was I, a factory set. You're almost never going to find that because the liability goes back to the manufacturer uh, because you got to make it idiot proof and firemen are. The, guarantee hey, hey, we, hey. we can break <laughs> anything. We can break anything. <laughs> you, we definitely can. You know. They're preset for that for like you said, there's a tag on it. They're preset. Yeah. It, yeah. That's oh, was that way there? It was okay this morning. I had a, fine this morning. I had a chief that used to tell us, you know, you take three firemen and lock them inside of a room with a hammer and a bowling ball. Come back in an hour, the bowling ball is gonna be broken, the hammer's gonna be missing, and no one's gonna know what happened. <laughs> I said, That's pretty accurate, Chief. Definitely definitely accurate. But no, that's good. Good discussion. So, uh, we talked about the, re the releasing mechanism, obviously, uh, the air pressure supervisory only. Um, okay, this is the pneumatic release. All right, so going into double interlock. Okay, so like we talked about single interlock, only one action is that detector. Air is supervisory only. And the double interlock requires two actions to trip the system. So then you're going to have um, two different solenoids, right? You're going to need, uh, like you'll hear people call them um, electric pneumatic. So you have an electric solenoid and a pneumatic solenoid. So the electric solenoid is going to be those smoke detectors, right, closing the circuit. That's going to open the electric solenoid, but water is not flowing yet. The valve is not tripped because it requires that second action of the sprinkler head breaking due to the fire, losing that air pressure. Once the air pressure loses, that's going to release the pneumatic uh, actuator, open that pneumatic solenoid. And now once you have the electric and the pneumatic solenoids both open, that's the only thing that's going to trip the system in double interlock. So double interlock pre-action systems are installed in places where you are really, really concerned about accidental water damage, right? Um, and the reason why these aren't as prevalently installed as the single interlock is because of that two action response. It doesn't act uh, as close to a wet system as that single interlock does. The single interlocking pre action system is very similar to a wet system because once the detectors operate, the valve is tripped and water is in the pipes ready to go when that sprinkler head breaks, which in the double interlock it's still not. Okay, does that make sense? They have pre actions a lot of freezers too. Yeah, most, uh, most smaller freezers they'll use the they'll use a wet system and mean? then they'll run with the the insert. Or dry pendant. Yeah, dry pendant. The whole right. column dry pendant. Right. Because I know you said you do in Papua though? Right? I did, yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's a warehouse in Papua that we do and it has a pre action. There's a lot of work. Wholesale, wholesale, whole food, whole food, I think it is. Whole, whole Foods? Yeah, it's not Whole Foods anymore. It's uh, that grocery store. I can save a lot. This was an interesting picture um, from Viking put in here. So uh, this frost is in that pipe because of the, um, the air compressor. Basically, the moisture that's being introduced into the system from the air compressor uh, in a freezer. Those are pretty good pictures. Yeah. That's why you're your nitrogen system it's it's dried air you know it has no moisture in the in the gas and it also keeps your the, you're talking about the nitrogen yeah 
Yeah. Alright, so here's the electric pneumatic solenoid. Same thing again, they have to be installed correctly. Basically just controlling the flow. Space, that's it, guys. You have any other discussions about it? Questions? I'm going to take a look outside. Good.